In a recent video, I briefly used a cassette tape winder, and for some, this was the star of the show. I received quite a few requests to make a video about it, so here it is. But be careful what you wish for, because I mean, a video about a tape winder, how interesting is that going to be? Well, let's find out. But first, you can't talk about tape winders without mentioning the Bic Pen. If you've ever found yourself with a cassette that looked like this, you could try and wind it back in with a finger, and it did work at a pinch pun intended, but if you had a Bic, well, then you were golden. A quick spin of the pen and everything was back to normal again. And if you're old enough, you may also recall someone winding a tape using this method, which I don't recommend, but I do remember resulting in a few tapes getting launched across my school bus back in the day. One thing about winding tapes back then was that it actually had a real-world cost associated with it. Imagine you got the Beverly Hills Cop soundtrack, you wanted to listen to Axel F, but it's all the way at the other end of the tape. Well, you could of course put the cassette in your Walkman and fast-forward it until you got to the right point, but fast-winding really sapped battery life, and it's hard to get across just how expensive batteries were when, like myself, your pocket money was just £2 a week. The original Sony Walkman managed to achieve a pretty good battery life of 8 hours from 2 AA alkaline, but the Sony Walkman range were expensive machines, way beyond the price of anything that my family could afford. No, my personal stereo was a cheap own brand version from Dixon's. With these ones, to save on manufacturing costs, they didn't even have rewind buttons, just fast forward. People my age will remember that meant if you wanted to rewind, you took the cassette out, flipped it over, fast forwarded it on the other side, then took it out again and put it back in the machine. Anyway, back to the issue with batteries. Looking at my old Tandy catalogue to get some prices from 1986, a pack of four own brand AA Alkalines were £1.99, and I'm pretty sure that was the average price for Duracells at this point as well. Well, when your personal stereo cost £15, spending £1 on two new batteries for it out of your own pocket money was a pretty big deal. To put it into perspective relating to, say, a smartphone nowadays that cost £1,000, that would mean that it would cost you approximately £66 every time you charged it up. So most of the time I could only afford non-alkalines, you know, standard batteries, which of course have a worse battery life. In this Sony TPS LP2, using normal batteries takes that playtime down from 8 hours to just 2.5. And, and remember, if you get giddy with the fast-forward button, you're going to get a fraction of that. On top of that, some of the cheaper off-brands of machines, the less well-engineered ones, would be a lot more power-hungry than an official Sony Walkman. So you might be wondering, why not use rechargeable batteries? Well, for me, there were two reasons. A standard AA outputs 1.5 volts. A rechargeable takes that down to 1.2 volts. And I've found over the years that many devices just really don't appreciate that voltage drop. They'll either run a little bit odd, or they'll just run for a very short amount of time. But on top of that, back in the day, getting up with rechargeable batteries and a charger was just far too expensive for me to even think about. Now my solution at the time was to get one of these. You see it all fits together this, that's why I was talking about batteries, because I bought a tape winder to save on battery life. It was designed to fold up small and fit in a pocket. With this I could wind one tape while I was listening to another, and once you got to the end of one side, the gears inside this are designed to slip so you won't accidentally snap or stretch the tape. Now I've seen another hand winder similar to this that was sold in Japan. It looks more sophisticated and it fits inside a cassette case, but it does seem to do the same thing. But yes, this really is my cassette winder from back in the day that I've kept for probably about 35 years now. I don't remember any of my friends having one of these, so they probably weren't all that common. However, the Bic Pen, well, I'd imagine almost everyone my age has wound up a cassette at some point with a Bic. But what about a pencil? Well, personally, no, I've never used a pencil to wind a cassette. However, I have noticed it's becoming a meme over the last few years. You can see posters and t-shirts, mugs and goodness knows what else, referring to cassettes being wound with a pencil. The problem with this idea is that while a Bic pen fits the spindle holes perfectly on a cassette, almost as if the two were made for one another, a pencil, well, in my experience, it's just too thin. Even if you hold it at an obtuse angle, it's still close to useless as it spends more time slipping than it does turning the spools. So what's the deal with this pencil and cassette beam? Well, I had an idea. Perhaps the pencils we use here in the UK are thinner than they use elsewhere in the world. And maybe the people who made those pictures aren't from the UK. Now, the pencils I've got here are made in Germany, and these are sold throughout Europe, and they're the same manufacturer and size as the ones I remember using in school. But 
what about the pencils in the US? Perhaps the meme creators are from there. Maybe their pencils are thicker. Well, one way to find out is to ask a friend who lives there. So that's exactly what I did. Greetings. This is an LGR cameo thing. I must admit, when it comes to winding compact cassettes, I always just used a big ballpoint pen with a cap on it back in the day. Or more often than that, I used one of these Bic crystal pins, which not only have a nice cap, but they have this hexagonal shape to the body itself. So winding a tape using the cap worked as you'd expect, but even just using the pins casing itself did the job since it caught the teeth of the reels just enough to move them. As for the pencil theory though, the standard in the US is a number two HB type pencil, like you'd traditionally get from companies like Dixon Ticonderoga. And while it has a similar six-sided angled design to the body as that big crystal pen, number two pencils are thinner, a bit too much to easily wind the reels of a compact cassette. You have to kind of angle it in this slightly uncomfortable way to make that happen, and personally I never saw anyone doing this back in the day, unless they were really desperate or something maybe. However, I was curious if the next size up pencil would do the trick. I remember having these beefy units in kindergarten or something, and while I can't imagine many tape enthusiasts had them lying around, I was just curious enough at this point and, eh, turns out it's actually too thick to even fit inside the reels. Although you can kinda jam the sharpened end inside there and move things around via friction, but neither pencil are anywhere near as useful as a classic ballpoint pen though. So I'm inclined to think that the whole using a pencil to wind a cassette meme is a tad revisionist, or perhaps we're just the weird ones for using pens instead of pencils. Well, at least that proves that I wasn't going mad, or at least I'm not alone in going mad. Perhaps it's one of those Mandela effect things that people are always going on about, but if you make those meme pictures, it might be time to go back and revise them. I've got to thank Clint from LGR for helping me out there, and I know we've got quite a crossover of subscribers, but if you aren't already a subscriber to his channel, you could help him get past that million subscriber mark if he hasn't already done that by the time this video goes live, and then he'll get a nice plaque from YouTube, which I suspect they'll probably have discontinued if I ever get close to achieving that milestone myself. But now on to the main event, the thing that people actually ask to see, the Sony Tape Winder. I found this while browsing Japanese auction sites looking for rare and unusual old cassette recorders and it was just lumped in with the cassette category and I'd never seen a Sony tape winder before and I really liked its neat design so of course I had to pick it up. Now it runs on either four AA batteries or from a DC power supply. The model number is BE-A200 and it was made in Japan and might not have been sold outside there. In Japan, this was a consumer product that retailed for 6,000 yen, although I don't know what years it was on sale. Now, of course, it's a very simple machine to operate. Inside the bottom here, you can see there's an arrow that indicates the direction in which the tape is going to be wound. So to wind a cassette, you just have to put the cassette in the correct way around and close the lid. It will automatically start winding it. You can see just about through this smoked plastic lid, the tape moving from the right hand reel to the left hand one. It's a very quiet machine in its operation, almost silent and very smooth as well. Now when you open the lid, of course, it stops winding. And the way that this operates is because there's a switch on the right hand side which gets depressed whenever the lid is closed. Now, so that it doesn't wind all the time that you've got the lid closed on it, even with no cassette inside, there is another switch in the bottom here which gets pushed in when you pop a cassette in there. Now it's not especially quick at winding tapes. I think most home decks that were powered from the mains power supply would do a quicker job than this. And whether this one's running on batteries or on its wall supply, it takes the same amount of time, which is approximately two minutes to wind a 60 minute tape. Now, as well as being a winder, it's also a tape eraser. I haven't tested this function yet myself, so let's give it a go. So as to have something to erase on this five minute cassette, I've taped a recorded message that was being played on the radio. Continue listening to Radio 3, as BBC Radio Wales is coming to the frequency from the 24th of October. It's announcing a frequency change for a radio station in my area. I've recorded that message onto both sides of the tape, so to wipe this tape off now, I'll need to press down this erase button, which activates the erase head and also brings it into contact with the tape. So to wipe it, it's just a matter of putting the cassette in there, pushing the button, you'll see the red LED light up next to the erase, and now when I close the lid and the tape winds from one reel to the other, that will erase it. Now, as I didn't have any instructions for this device, I just assumed that doing that would wipe the tape off on both sides. It would completely erase the tape from one end to the other. But when I put it in my player, well, the message was still there. If you're 
in Cheshire, Merseyside, Flintshire or Wrexham FM. However, upon turning the cassette over, it turns out that the other side is the one that's been erased, the one that I fast-forwarded through. So it does only erase one half of the tape at a time, which is much more sensible for a consumer product. You don't necessarily want to erase a whole tape every time, just the recording on one side. Now, of course, if you were erasing cassettes in a commercial environment, say you were erasing dictation tapes once they've been used, you wouldn't use something like this. This is just for individual use, really. You'd use a bulk tape eraser. With something like this, you'd just zap a cassette it would just erase the whole thing in one quick go. When I first saw it for sale on the auction site the thumbnail picture made it look like an unusual Walkman so I'd recommend if you got one of these you'd keep it out of the hands of children because they might mistake it for one of those as well and in just a few seconds your tapes could be erased because the machine ignores the right protect notches on any pre-recorded cassettes. In what will surely be remembered as the YouTube event of the year, I thought I'd stage a race of man versus machine. The automatic winder versus the Tandy hand winder, which in the catalogue they stated could wind a C90 cassette in just 60 seconds. Well, I've got two C60s here, so let's give it a go. Now, I should really add in some cheering crowd sound effects here. But it took me all of a minute to wind my C60 tape, which is slightly slower than advertised, but I haven't really been in training for this. Now I've got to say though that the hand winder is pretty rough on the tape. The occasional jerky stop and start from doing it manually will most likely result in the tape getting stretched, leading to wow during playback. The Sony winder might be taking its time, but it's looking after the tape while it's winding it. The Sony would be useful for enthusiasts perhaps to spare unnecessary wear and tear on a valuable machine. I know there's some people out there that do have a second tape recorder which they use just as a dedicated winder. Anyway after two minutes the automatic winder's finished as well so it takes about twice as long in the end but the tape inside has been looked after. Now if you want to know where to find one of these the answer is Japan probably 25 years ago but now well your best bet is to look on the Japanese auction sites. However, now it's time to wind this one up. Yes, I know. And thanks again to Clint at Lazy Game Reviews for his help with this. And hopefully between the two of us, we've managed to make an interesting video about the rather dry subject of cassette tape winders. But that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching.